Allora gente, eh, mh, poche ore fa come vi stavo dicendo è uscito il documentario su eh, Monkey Island o meglio sull'ultimo Monkey Island e quindi ho pensato che sia una, pess- una bellissima beh, perché ho detto pessima, una bellissima occasione per vederlo insieme direttamente e cogliere l'occasione perché molti di voi probabilmente non, non l'hanno visto perché è letteralmente appena uscito ok? per uh, contesto è un altro dei documentari di questo canale che si chiama No Clip che uh, fa proprio questo nel senso realizza uh, documentari videoludici e praticamente sono tutti belli tutti quelli che ho visto e ne abbiamo visti anche parecchi insieme ormai uh, si sono rivelati essere veramente una figata Quindi sono molto contento di eh, vederlo insieme a voi e quindi direi di partire. Si chiama Returning to Monkey Island, no clip documentary. Eccolo qua. Adesso silenziare la musica, riaccendere l'audio. Eccoci qua, eccoci qua. Allora, i i sottotitoli ci sono. Dovrebbe essere tutto a posto. Siete pronti? Vai. Che ricordi, ragazzi. The thing about stories is that they change. We tweak the narratives, forget parts and embellish others. And this problem when it gets worse once time gets involved because it's not just the stories that change, it's us too. How we see the world, how we see ourselves and how we remember the past. It's impossible to talk about a series like Monkey Island without indulging in some nostalgia. So let me tell you a quick story. One of my earliest gaming memories was playing The Secret of Monkey Island on my family's Amiga 600. I was four years old Madonna, when the game came out, so probably around five or six by the time myself and my brother tried to complete it. To me, The Secret of Monkey Island was a window into an entirely new world, an impossible game that took all summer to complete. I remember it in its diluted 256 Commodore graphics, not the original vivid EGA palette. To me, its soundtrack didn't play on a CD like players of the 1992 PC version. Instead, it was the fantastic, crunchy, funky Amiga version, which absolutely no questions asked has the best version of LeChuck's theme, hands down. I have no nostalgia towards the code wheel that came as a form of DRM with the boxed version, as my copy of the game was an illegal copy. I loved completing The Secret of Monkey Island. I enjoyed LeChuck's Revenge too, but I never actually completed it. I skipped three entirely, having no access to a PC back then, but loved Escape, and then dabbled in the Telltale games when they came out. Each of us has our own version of Monkey Island in our heads, based on when we played the games, in what order, how old we were, and whether we figured out the Monkey Wrench puzzle. So when I learned that not only were Lucas making a sequel three decades after the first game's release, but that they had somehow convinced the original co-creator Ron Gilbert to helm them, a man who famously said he'd never work on a game he didn't own the rights to ever again, well, I knew there was a story here. There's a lot to cover, from how Devolver convinced everyone to make this happen, to the vivid new art style, which characters returned and which didn't make the cut, the power of fandom, the difficulty with canon, and the reaction to the ending, which finally revealed the secret of Monkey Island, exactly how it was imagined over 30 years ago. But before we talk about where we are now, let's first remember the many adventures and ports of call that led us to this moment. Un viaggio nella nostalgia proprio. Sì, la scintilla che lanciò all'epoca le avventure grafiche, assolutamente. E questa è anche una citazione. Well, the Secret of Monkey Island was my very che first meraviglia game, uh, in the industry. questa I musichetta started in 1989 and, and jumped right onto that. Uh, worked with, uh, with Ron Gilbert and Tim Schafer on it. And we were all in our 20s. It was a, you know, kind of a happy little like, oh, it's our you know, first or second job. And, and uh, we're, we're out on this idyllic ranch in the middle of nowhere with like a restaurant quality chef making us food and the trees around and animals. And um, 
we, we all loved our, our work and it was like, oh, we, just, we were just kind of playing. It was like being at summer camp or something. We wasted a lot of time uh, playing arcade games with each other. And uh, somehow we managed to uh, make a couple of games in there. Um, yeah, it was great. It was, uh, it was a bad introduction to um, the world of professional game making for me because I compare everything to that and most things can fall kind of short. I had it on my uh, on my Commodore Amiga 500. I still have it. Um, still have all the the boxes and the discs and the um, you know the copy protection wheels and all of that stuff. Like it really was just like a box of treasure. You know all of those things in there. I just um, they were just so special to me. Like all of the disc swapping probably was like the most of the exercise I got um, the year that Monkey Island came out. But um, yeah, I, I just love those games mm. so much. They were more popular in Europe. It's right. true. Like here there was. There was definitely a, like a Sierra LucasArts thing in the United States, and it was LucasArts Sierra thing in Europe. Questa non la sapevo. It made back its investment, I think, um, but it wasn't a, an immediate smash success. I mean, the industry wasn't even that big at that time. It's just it's just sort of hung around for a long time and and, and developed a big nostalgic uh, following since then. Well, the first one totally changed what I thought about games. Um, I, suddenly games had just like loads of atmosphere. Um, I mean, the, the games are funny and everyone talks about the humor, but the world was just so rich. And having come from maybe playing some, you know, kind of side scrolling platform games and shoot 'em ups, suddenly there was a world that I really cared about. I wasn't just like just running past it like it was scenery and like a had a Barbera cartoon. Well, in terms of design, oh, i cartoni Anna Barbera pure quelli che belli. Sessions where all of us would get together, mostly uh, Ron and Tim and myself. Uh, oftentimes, Steve Purcell would be there. Uh, Noah Falstein might wander in. He was just sort of everywhere, uh, and we would um, sort of crack on the story and the puzzles. And then when it came to uh, implementing things, then we took a little more individual responsibility. And Tim and I would have like, this is my room, this is your room. Um, the characters in the room belong to you. Uh, I tended to write a lot of the ones who were in groups, like the, the low moral fiber pirates on the corner, and the circus guys. <laughs> Pirati di bassa fibra morale. Um, there was a point we, we started uh, working on Melee Island and, and there's a lot of characters on Melee Island, so there was a lot to do. And then, sì, per chi lo uh, sta chiedendo, è un documentario su Monkey Island, I ragazzi. Like, okay, time to start on Monkey Island. Dave, you take that and we'll leave Tim on, on, on Melee. And I'm like, all right. And I quickly realized, that there's, there's no people here. There's nothing to grab onto, nothing to give it flavor. And so that's why, like, there are notes all over the island, for example, so that, you know, even when you're sort of out in the wilderness away from people, there's still a little bit of a like, oh, yeah, somebody's here. They're talking to each other. Something's going on. In some ways, I think we take good writing for granted now in video games these days. Games that really had strong writing and strong characters were a lot, a lot harder to come by. And especially ones that had great writing and characters and were actually funny, which was a tremendous <laughs> rarity. It was the, the, the character... Che bello the, la ga uh, la monkey island, the really, lo scontro really di insulti. Um, you know, I will always remember, you know, the, 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 the thing that sticks with me, that... that that scene when uh, when Guybrush and Elaine first come together on the Vero. docks of Melee Island, you know, and and the music swells, you know, Plunder Buddy, you know, I mean, it's just that that didn't exist at the time. So um, so that that really that really got me. I mean, Guybrush is um, he is everyone's hero in the sense that he is he is a hero that anyone could be, which which I think is. Uh, is part of what makes him so relatable. Uh, you know, he certainly, you know, he has his wits and he has his charms, but uh, he is not uh, possessed of any tremendous skill that most of us don't have in one form or another. Um, it's, it, he almost, uh, he, he perseveres through a sheer force of will. Well, the way things got greenlit at LucasArts in those days was essentially by the group of the project leaders uh, at the studio. Um, you, one of them would uh, make a pitch and sort of plan it out, make a budget, and this, this kind of thing, and bring it before the group and, and sort of detail it all out. And they would usually say, that's good, cut five characters in three locations and you're good to go. And I don't remember there ever being any discussion over whether uh, Monkey Island would have a sequel. Just we sort of got to the end and that was the next thing Ron was going to do. He just started working on it right away. 
the second game that I was I was I was so emotional when I finished it. You know, I I, I just didn't know what to do with myself once I'd, I'd finished uh, taking Guybrush on that adventure. So yeah, they were they were a big deal to me. Ho giocato più il 2 dell'1. On that second Amiga game as well. So. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. I think at some point I actually managed to afford a hard drive. So um, <laughs> I it just it was just incredible. I played the whole game again immediately just to find out what it was like without any disc swapping. Some people at the studio were probably thinking about whether the games were successful or not, but I wasn't one of them. Uh, you know, this was a, it was uh, above my pay grade until Day of the Tentacle. And B, you know, the atmosphere was Day of the just, Tentacle non l'ho giocato. L'ho giocato fun. un pochino insieme and a un mio amico. If, if we think it's fun, then it probably is fun. And we did test it out on, on people. We would bring in friends and family sort of midway through the production, you know, of when the game was playable, and sit them down and give them pizza and, uh, and, and sodas and just watch them. And if they were laughing, then that was good. We knew we were doing a good job. And if they were sort of confused and lost, then we would ask them why and we would fix that before we ship the game. But um, yeah, especially since there was a huge film company behind us financially, there wasn't a lot of pressure at first to, uh, to be a financial success. Uh, that came later. Sì, ogni cosa che facevo deve cambiare dischetto, vero, me lo ricordo, e l'hard disk a 20 mega per l'amica costava più dell'amica stesso, non ho per tanti anni neanche saputo che esistesse, era completamente fuori dal mio radar. Figurati dal portafoglio. Oh, il sequel ha avuto migliori grafici, ha avuto 8 out of 10 per grafici, rather than 7 out of 10 in the magazine review. But, um, i don't really remember like seeing sort of a style slightly changing and I was at an age then where I got deluxe paint on my Amiga and I was trying to do my own stuff and I, I was really interested in the process that had happened and what had changed and you know on the surface it, it, it could kind of look very similar but you know I, I started to learn how the, the backgrounds in the second game had been painted and scanned in and, and that was something that really stood, stood out to me. It was, it was a game that made me want to investigate what it was like to make a game, uh, probably more than any other one. I think there was uh, more subtlety in the, the different um, islands that you went to. It, it didn't feel <laughs> like, say, the first game or a lot of other early point and click games where you were going in from one room to another room to another room and there but but in Monkey Island 2 it was like much more kind of complex and um the environment's kind of oh you know, la parte col vestito and then uh, as some will know there was a kind of a big hiatus uh, curse of monkey island came out a, a few years later that uh, was made by some other friends of ours and none of us worked on that uh, what did you make of the third game because obviously that was such a departure art, art style wise Um, sì, e io non l'ho giocato questo. Ho giocato l'1 e il 2. Yeah, I think it's really beautiful. I think it like it was a, it was a big shock back then. Um in the same way that other, you know, Monkey Islands coming along with different art styles can shock people. Yeah, I, I, I think it's you know, the design of the 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 characters is just exquisite. Um being able to see all of that extra detail. Um, i think it Infatti io mi avevo avuto, invidiavo l'amico ricco con l'amica 2000 che ce l'aveva. So, um, I was I was almost a bit kind of overwhelmed with the amount of pixels that were on screen. I mean, if you play it now it still looks super low res, but you know, to me it was just like this is the equivalent of like 16K or something. It was just like so high res. Ecco, questa About sensazione me la ricordo. Two months before the audition, I had literally told a friend uh, that of all the video games, all the interactive things out there, my dream job would be to voice Guybrush Threepwood in Monkey Island 3. But I told him, yeah, but that's never going to happen. And Ron's left LucasArts, the, the series is long dead, so that's too bad. But that would be my favorite. That would be my dream job. And then two months later, there it was. I could just talk about Good Soup history all day. How about that first fateful journey made to the Caribbean? Oh, you Mark, mean the one that... Then there was um oh, I skipped Terzo un passo che devo passare essere considerato a livello, ve lo ricordo con amore, lo sia e ci sta, ci sta. Uh, that was in there somewhere. Anyway, sì, che sia per contenuti di qualità. Grazie and mille, grazie mille. Another hiatus and then uh, a company called Telltale picked it up where I happened to be working much to my surprise actually at the time I didn't know. Neanche we questi tre dili ho mai giocati? So this is a and uh, that was uh, Tales of Monkey Island was a sort of uh, short run limited ser series uh, of games rather than a kind of a long form movie like game. I got called into the, the you know the boss's office at Delta and he said we're going to do Monkey Island and I was like really? Oh, uh, 
okay, that's a little weird, and I'm not sure I actually want to do that right now. But um, you know, let's call uh, let's call Ron, and and he was like, oh no, no, can't can't do that. It's a secret. You know, we we can't uh, we can't tell anybody. And it was a while before I was actually, uh, I guess the ink had to dry on the contracts and that sort of thing, before I was actually allowed to call Ron at all. And he was a little thrown by that, you know, but he was, um, he was like, can you come and do this with us? And he said, I, there's, there's no way I'm, I'm doing another project right now. I'm in the middle of it. Uh, but he did take a week and came down and we just sort of threw everything that was sort of on the table so far. And here's some plans we're making. And, Asked him what he thought, and he was like, "Yeah, you're treating Elaine kind of wrong. She should be a little more sisterly, and you know, she should she should always be one step ahead of everybody." And we're like, "Yeah, yeah, that's that's good. It's good notes, good notes." And then we sort of went about our, mm. our merry way. But yeah, mostly he didn't he didn't get to put his thumbprints on that one. The uh, the built up expectations over um, just years of nostalgia, and the impossibility of ever meeting that sort of thing with a sequel, like, "Oh, do make it the same but better," is. That's paradoxical, and you can't do it. Uh, and and that was what made me terrified to even approach the project. But ultimately, you know, we just sort of we we had to do it. And um, there was a lot of experience in the room with Monkey Island, both just people who had grown up on it and people who had worked on it. And the you know, artists and the designers were all pretty steeped in it. I had Stemley with me. Mark Darren was a big fan. Those guys did most of the story and design work on it. So kudos to them. I pressured them a little bit to hew to some themes which was, was kind of a new thing for me. When we made the first two, we just sort of blindly struck out and sort of wrote whatever pizza. was in our minds grazie, at the time. But we were all a little older now by the time we were doing Tales. The so these were people in their 40s. Of the the of of play. So we wound up with this sort of big treatise on, on trust and who should you trust, who shouldn't you trust, and what happens when you do State of play to Final uh, Fantasy VII uh, Rebirth. actually pretty well. Monkey Island, like so many games of that era, was unable to survive the capsizing of the adventure game genre. While the Telltale games gave it a second wind, there was something about the series that felt like it was from a bygone era. I, like many fans, had resigned myself to it never coming back. I played the special editions of the games when they came out in 2009 and 2010, but the idea of a new game never crossed my mind. Especially as Ron Gilbert had left the series behind and was working on new adventure games like Thimbleweed Park. For years, esatto. Ron ran a blog called Thimbleweed Park, Gamer, ragazzi, sono avete giocato è molto carino. Work and how he felt about the games industry. Ron doesn't strike me as a grumpy guy, but like anyone who rode the wave of a popular genre right up until it crashed into the rocky shoreline, he's got scars. It was going to take some special people and special circumstances to lure him back to Monkey Island. Non pensavo neanche io che avrei mai rivisto un Monkey Island di Ron Gilbert. It came together because Nigel contacted me at PAX, I guess 2019. He he knew somebody in in Disney. Ok, in Disney, è proprio lui quindi. Ah, mi sembrava stava non ci fosse il documentario. Thought, well, I think we could probably do another Monkey Island if you're interested in it. It's not something I was pitching around to people, you know, doing another Monkey Island. There was a lot about I wasn't sure that I really wanted to do another Monkey Island. Um, and that's when I contacted Dave Grossman. So Ron, Ron and I were on a Slack. Hey, are you there? Can you can you talk? And I was like, sure, sure. Can you keep a secret? And I was like, yes, I can. And he said, uh, well, you know, I've been I've been uh, talking to these uh, the, these guys that I know. I, there's this guy Nigel from Devolver, and he knows this guy John Drake at Disney, and they're talking about the possibility of doing another Monkey Island game. And I'm thinking about it. And would you do it with me? You know, come partner partner with me on this. And I was like in right away. I was like, this is the situation under which I want to make Monkey Island. Like, it's Ron's here, he's, he's, he's running the show, I'm in. <laughs> There's always been this really dedicated audience that loved these products. We could do remasters and they would come buy them. We would do re-releases on Steam or Good Old Games or whatever and we would, we would get reactions. And the great thing that, that Terrible Toy Box has been doing in the interim since we sort of stopped doing those games was they've been continuing to keep that audience alive for that style of game and, and that kind of game in a very cool and unique way that is very much you know driven by Ron and, and the folks around him. And and so it was an obvious yes. I mean the only real you know, question for us is, Park do we have the capacity to do it, when would we do it? You know, how do we how do we make it work inside a world in which we are 
you know, dealing with a whole bunch of other things uh, at any given moment. So it was always a, yes, how do we make that happen? How do we tell the next Monkey Island story? We know that Monkey Island is kind of the crown jewel of all of those games in terms of having still a st sustained base of rabid fans who are still talking about it and playing it. And so we knew there was an audience there. It wasn't a question of, will there be an audience for this? Will people come back for it? And then it just comes down to, like, what does Ron want to do? Like, how does he want to do no, it? No, no. L'ultimo Monkey Island di cui stanno What's parlando sort of non è un remake. To re -engage in something that's è un seguito. Been kind of dormant for, you know, over a decade now. They definitely had some trepidation about, like, how many layers there were going to be on the project. There's, you know, Devolver doing approvals and Disney doing approvals, and there was going to be a lot of a lot of stuff around that and he wasn't sure like do we have a good idea you know what, what do we want to do with it he flew uh flew up here for a day and we just i guess a weekend and we just kind of hashed everything out it's like okay do we want to make this game what would it be because the important thing to me was i didn't want to make just another monkey island you know i didn't want to just say oh here's the ip let's slap guybrush in and do stuff um i wanted to make a game that meant something and It was really you know, kind of hashing all that out with Dave and really deciding whether we had something that was actually meaningful and not just another monkey island. So I, you know, I flipped Ron's house and we spent basically like about a day and a half just sort of getting our ducks together and talking about what we wanted to do. And we, we, we were kind of in the same place on this because uh, the monkey island games have always been an avenue for us to sort of write about ourselves and what's going on in our lives first one was you know about somebody embarking on a new career and being really excited about it and finding that other things might be more important than that and the second one was kind of about making a sequel and how that's hard and so this one we thought you know let's let's do something about Uh, being an old experienced hand in an industry that's changing and where the way things are done are not what you remember. So we kind of started from that. Uh, Ron felt it was very important to uh, address this whole secret of Monkey Island thing that we had sort of left hanging. We thought it should sort of be about how these uh, things, the secret or the game, the secret of Monkey Island, sort of take on an importance over time via nostalgia and get built up to things that you then become obsessed with and where that can take you. So there's, there's uh, Guybrush has some, some definite obsessive qualities in this game that come straight out of that as a, as a theme. Oh yeah, it was all, all, all <laughs> autobiographic. Yeah, it really, really wasn't about, you know, looking at, you know, pros and cons and all that stuff. It was like, okay, do we have a good story? So I was spending the weekend just thinking about what would the story be? Where will we take Guybrush? Where will we take the world? It was through that process that we had come up with the, the you know the idea of Boybrush and you know Guybrush has a has a son and he's telling his son the story. Um, the other thing I also knew is I wanted the game to start right at the end of Monkey Island 2 which is a really difficult thing to do, right? This kind of, I think, gave us a creatively a really interesting place to kind of start and be true to that. It does happen right at the end of Mugan too, just not in the way a lot of people thought it would. And then we roughed out a plot. We think it would be great to um, meet LeChuck's crew and have a section where you're on LeChuck's ship. And that was, you know, that idea came straight out of that weekend and it never changed. It was like our, our best and favorite idea I think the whole time and it's possibly my favorite chapter of the game so one more year forse anche il mio in effetti but we came out of it with like kind of four-fifths of the plot of the game it was really you know kind of hashing all that out with Dave and really deciding whether we had something that was actually meaningful and not just another monkey island and so after he left then I contacted Nigel and said okay let's do this thing you know I, I was very clear that I really want you know, my creative freedom, you know, I want to be able to make the game I want to make, which, you know, Disney couldn't agree to. It's like, they're, they're a huge company and they're just going, oh, we can't agree to that. It took uh, seven months to line up all the contracts <laughs> before the game. So it was July before we actually started paying ourselves. And we're like, okay, now we, okay, everything's serious. We're actually going to do this now and we're sure about it. You know, I, I felt good enough in talking to them that I had their assurance that you know we we will do that even though we can't contractually Excellent. say we will do that. And they and they were true to their word. People have to put things in contracts to protect themselves, and they were all very scary to read. And uh, uh, but then eventually they're like, okay, I, I think we've come to an agreement. And, then, and it turned out all that was 
it was just a non-issue. Like, uh, it was really cool. They did let us make the game that we wanted to make. They just gave us some suggestions. They were actually really nice and hands-off about it. So. Um, there's very little um, in that game that we had to change. The things that we had to change um, that they wanted to change were really for legal reasons and were very legitimate. You know, we're going to get sued if you do that <laughs> type stuff. But creatively, we really did have complete control. It's like the Q-tip in a secret. Yes, yes, I remember that well. <laughs> that was my introduction to the legal system. <laughs> Any good adventure needs a talented crew. And for this one, Ron and Dave were going to go for some old and some new. Like any good nostalgia trip, this journey was going to need a return of some familiar faces. But to rely too much on callbacks could result in a game that felt out of step with the times. So they'd need some new ideas too, some new blood, and perhaps a new lick of paint. Ron's career has spanned many interesting projects, but in recent years he's enjoyed the return to the classic point-and-click game. His 2017 original Thimbleweek Park made double its goal via Kickstarter, and saw Ron joining forces with ex-Lucas programmer David Fox. Jen Sandercock was a producer on that title too, making up the backbone of Ron's new crew. No, che bello che hanno ripreso un po' di, di, per, di, di personaggio originale a parte Ron Gilbert. So first game was called Rescue on Fractalus, which was a first person flight game, shooting game. Then Labyrinth, based on the film, I was the designer and project leader on that. And then Ron asked me if I could help with Maniac Mansion. So I became oh, the first game giocato, ragazzi. in the world. Però lo conosco. Um, then I did my own game, Zack McCracken and the Alien Mindbenders, also using Scum, expanded version of it. And then both Noah Faustine, Ron Gilbert, and I worked on Indiana Jones and Monster Questo State. sì, invece, and me lo ricordo we bene. Three of us working together because we had a very tight deadline. We tried to get it out near the launch of the film. David's the guy who hired me at LucasArts in 1989. You know, Ron was in charge of my project, but David was the, uh, the hiring manager for that, and he was around there. And it, it, I knew him there a couple of years um, before he left to do, he did a lot of uh, on-site entertainment stuff. He was really into these sort of pods that you would get in that would move around and stuff. So I think we set kind of the mechanisms in place for Monkey Island with a smaller team for Thimbleweed Park. It was fun, it was a great project. The fun that we had in making it, you know, shows in how the game came out. To be able to be part of it, I had to keep pinching myself, and I think there was a number of other people on the team who were the same. I started with the project maybe from day five or something, no, not like the beginning. So Ron and David already had their brainstorming, but then we like started work. So they had a good idea of like all the worlds and areas we were going to work in. So when Rex came in, he was starting with the mood boards for specific um, areas, you know, starting with Melee and some of the places we visit. Back in what, 2008, he had sent me, just out of the blue, I did not know who he was at all, he sent me this picture that he had done of Guybrush, essentially fan art. And it was really um, interesting to me. I just, I just loved it because it was this very kind of stylized, you know, angular take on the whole thing. And it was so different from what everyone else was doing. I guess it was around the time that the remakes of the original Monkey Island and Monkey Island 2 were announced. Um, and it was it was interesting to see how they'd updated the you know the designs of the characters. You know the the great thing about art is there's there's never a right answer. You know it's like everyone's got their own takes on it. So I was kind of stimulated by that to to like think well how would I do Guybrush if I was going to do him instead of taking the approach of like maybe just working up the detail and just going from a small amount of pixels to a large amount of pixels and like figuring out oh well where are we going to put all the like laughter lines and the like you know tiny little details and things like that I thought well it would be interesting to kind of stick to pixel art but but kind of make it hand painted and make it more like a sort of kind of boxy, you know. Um, I think the, the early character designs in games are so strong because they were so limited um, and they had to be so readable and understandable at that tiny scale. And it was just done for fun, you know. I think I did it, hmm. it was probably when I was leading 
tear away a medium molecule and I just did it in my lunch break as like a joke or something and um, and put it on Twitter and, and then you know Ron picked up on it and he posted it and said it was his favorite version of Guybrush ever uh, which was a bit of a surprise <laughs> and so I made it my desktop you know on my computer I did it, it was that way for years it was just my desktop um, and then when when Monkey Island started you one of the decisions that that I had early on in the project was, do I do this as pixel art or do I do it as not pixel art? And I really decided I didn't want to do it as, as pixel art. And then it became, well, what should it look like, right? I mean, I think for most people, when they think of, you know, non-pixel Macan, they think of Macan 3, you know, that kind of cartoony, Disney-esque, you know, hand-painted type style. And I was never a huge fan of that. And so I just, I wanted to come up with something different. And that's when I remembered Rex's art. And so I looked him up, <laughs> I found him, and I just sent him an anonymous email. Uh, at no point did I twig that it was gonna be a new Monkey Island game. I mean, I'm an idiot, cause I should have worked that out really. But, um, and I actually kind of signed up without knowing that it was gonna be Monkey Island. But yeah, when he told me, I just, you know, I, I really did, you know, well. It was, it was a real like mic drop moment, uh, <laughs> so it was such a shock. I'm thinking, well, I know Ron's always working on some game. I'm gonna go get coffee with him. And, and, and in my mind, the best case scenario is he's working on some new game and maybe there's like some little role in this game and he just thought to himself, hey, Dom would be cool for that. And I was thinking that would be so cool if I got to work with Ron on some other game. I never got to work with him and blah, blah, blah. So we sit down, we're having coffee, and we're just sitting outside on the sidewalk in Seattle and just chatting, whatever, for 10 or 15 minutes. And then he says, and then he says, well, do you want to know what the project is? I said, yeah, I'd love to hear about the project. What is it? And he says to me, I'm making another Monkey Island game. And I was like, what? And I just, <laughs> I lost my mind and I jumped up and Ella, I swear, è stata I la mia stessa reazione before he told me, as he's getting ready to tell visto me, il primo I trailer. never, I did not think he was going to say, it, it wasn't even a possibility in my head. I don't know why. I, I, I mean, yeah. I, I know everyone's thinking, like, well, Dom, of course he's doing another Mike Island. Why would you not at least suspect that? But I just I just didn't. And I think partially it's a defense mechanism. I love doing it so much that every time we rap, every time we rap it's like I just have to tell myself it's gone forever. We had a great run. It was fun because otherwise I'll drive myself nuts. I did that the first time. I drove myself nuts hoping it was going to come back. So I, as, as a coping mechanism, I think I just... Like that's my reality. It's done. We're never coming back to it. So, so yeah, I uh, I had a I had a good time with that. <laughs> Before production on Return to Monkey Island ever began, Ron and David Fox worked on a spin-off for Thimbleweed Park called Dolores. This re-engineered the original game's engine and would act as a foundation for Return to Monkey Island. Being able to like know our gameplay aspetta, mechanics aspetta, before come? we even started the game is just like a massive leg up to tons and tons of games out there. And so that meant we didn't need to explore that. We could explore art and story and, and that size and the puzzles, you know. That's interesting. Does that make for a shorter pre un titolo che non conosco. I would say so, yeah. Uh, th this was a little bit different for me because a, a the game series existed before you know everything I've ever done before now has always been like you're actually creating a, an original IP and it doesn't exist till you work on it you know it's like oh and that's in back solo giocato oh like, little big planet oh, yeah, la miseria planet. you know you're just making something that turns into little big planet uh, and th this is also different in that Ron had that image of Guybrush that he really loved and kind of initially actually think about well how would I do that image now and also try and like draw out of well what was it about that image that Ron particularly liked because it's quite a simple image there's not a lot there I mean it's it's not like I did an enormous um, concept painting of like the whole of the tri-island area or anything you know it's like one guy's head essentially what i wanted to bring to it the thing that i felt i could latch onto was the storyline that was in um in, in return to monkey island and the way that guybrush is telling this whole tale to his son and it felt that maybe bringing some kind of slightly um storybook painted storybook element to the art style could be a way of both having that art that Ron liked but also a world that had enough texture and enough believability to really feel like it's alive and that you're there but you're not kind of 
expecting it to look photorealistic. We kind of did multiple passes over the whole game. We started by, with like mood boards for each of the different areas. And then once we had those mood boards, we then um, broke it down into, we're just going to focus on the rooms for a particular um, island or scene first. We started with the um, with Act 2 on the ship because that was a very self-contained area that was not interconnected. And from there we, we did what we called thumbnail art for everything. So it was very blocky art, it still had colour um, for the most part. And then our programmers could take that, hook it up, like get the character walking around. And so we had all of that working, you could play the game start to play it start to finish by the end of our pre-production we basically like made a very simple version of the entire game that was just in very very um like block colors um so that you could almost like squint and you know just you know you'd be able to still recognize where they were the color palettes were just so important and you know i had a discussion with ron because he was like well this is only because of ega colors it wasn't like we chose these ones <laughs> well somebody would have chosen them but you know it was so limited um, with what you could do on some of the vero. versions um, but i i, I still think una forte limitazione di colori all'inizio really what gives a lot of games with a lot of history a very strong visual identity and is very keen to continue that it gives players the feeling of they're in a certain section at the moment and then there's there's almost like you know there's the reward of getting to a new section and really feeling that they've got somewhere new um, because essentially you know point and click adventure games can't just give people like 5000 xp or something you know that we don't we don't have like currency or anything we just have to reward that. you with more pictures to walk around in so you know you want them to be exciting and 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 feel very different from where they've been whether that's you know the color palette or you know a whole bunch of other things and then once we did that we basically repeated that whole process again uh twice so we then did the art all over again and then we started adding in some animations. The final pass on art was less of the rooms, it was like what are the ones that we either think aren't standing up to the same quality as others or what are the ones that we want to be wow rooms. We had this idea of some of the rooms we wanted to be ones where you could just sit and like appreciate it such as uh, La Anca where you're under the water and there's fish everywhere you know there is a time limit on how much you can appreciate that one but we did we had like a couple of like these are our wow rooms where you're just gonna sit and enjoy it. I think the reason I didn't want to do Pixar for the game is I didn't want the game to be just a nostalgia play and I feel that had I done it with Pixar it just would have been a nostalgia game. Probabilmente sì. It was very much a nostalgia game, but that was really the point of the Kickstarter, right? The whole Kickstarter was about nostalgia. And so it made sense, but with with this game I really wanted to be able to not just go after that core audience. I I really wanted new people to experience the game. And I think Pixel art is an art form and it's a it's a fascinating art form and I love pixel art but for a lot of people in the world they see pixel art and they just discount it right and I I didn't want to kind of have to have to deal with that so you know the game ironically the whole game is about nostalgia it is the that is the point of the game um but the game isn't a nostalgia play if that makes sense, right? They're, they're two kind of kind of separate things. Sì, assolutamente. Off the shelf tools Senso. on this project. So for animation, we used um, Spine, which it, which we didn't use for Thimbleweed Park. Thimbleweed Park was much more, um, I guess, just um, cell frame animation, essentially. Here we have we could actually do more of Sindhu stretches and all sorts of other great things with this, with this tool, very powerful tool. For sound, we used FMOD. There, there, there was one tool that was very similar to both games called Wimpy. You have to ask Ron where he came up with a name for that. But that's the one we used for helping to block objects in the room, set different states of the objects, set up where the, the walk boxes were going to be. When setting up the walk boxes, we also have like uh, scale regions. So like in this area, you know, when the guy wishes here, he's this size. When he's there, he's that size, and it'll it scale between those. We had parallax layers. We did that with Thimbleweed Park too. So you have like multiple layers, 
and there's a max, I think it was six, you could go in and say at what rate they pan in relation to the, the main background layer. There's no way I'm getting through there. Lighting only affects characters. Mm. So, so if there's lighting in the room, that's all built, that's all baked in. But then a character might walk into where light, like a lamp is hanging down. And that's where we would add lighting by saying, here's this color light, it's like in this area, here's the, this, the region, here's like the intense region, here's the blend out region to, to nothing. By changing the value of the light to dark, you could essentially use it for creating shadows. So when someone walked into a shadow area, we just put a light there that was darker than the ambient light. If it was a, uh, some lights could have a, a randomly flicker between two different colors. Um, so if you, it was a fire or flame, you could have like a flicker effect on him. What exactly is a scorched Alaska? Imagine a dessert shaped like a huge legless jellyfish with a texture like ice cream wrapped in packing foam, and it sets your face on fire when you eat it. <laughs> Appetizing. Not really. Pretty soon we were, you know, we were into production. We were actually making things, but we were still revising the design most of the way uh, through the entire production because nothing is ever quite right. Once it came time to, to build things, um, the script was my job. So I was the principal script writer and I probably did about 85% of it. Ron is a funny guy and wanted to keep his hands in. So he would take like particular characters and scenes that he cared more about. And, uh, and either do them or weigh in on them. And so there's there's like LeChuck on his ship. It's, it's, always, it's mostly like cranky characters. He really likes to do them. So Cobb in the bar and um, the two quarantined pirates on the ship. By the time we were done, we had a large, maybe 20 page outline of the story that, that's gonna happen. But, you know, big beats, you know, not the small beats. The small beats are the things that, for an adventure game, when you're actually starting to design the puzzles, right? We're not even doing puzzle design at that point. Um, but when you start to do the puzzles, you you have to answer the small beats because the puzzles are the kind of the mechanics of everything. And so when we start doing the puzzles, then we kind of have to figure out, well, what are the small beats to the story? Why does somebody want, you know, the wrench? You know, we know we want a wrench, but why do they want the wrench, right? You can't just Madonna, quella della chiave inglese me la ricorderò finché campo probabilmente. Why they want the wrench. È uno di quei problemi di traduzione. Monkey wrench in inglese significa chiave inglese, ma tu devi usare la scimmia. Madonna. To make a Monkey Island game, you first have to make some islands. Not just Monkey Island, but presumably Melee, and maybe a few new ones thrown in there too. So how did the team approach this challenge? What islands made a return? Which ones got caught? And how did they figure out which characters were going to make it into Guybrush's most recent chapter? Hmm. In some ways, Melee was one of the easier places to do because you always had some artwork to compare to. Definitely the um, the dock and um, the low street because they're just such iconic locations. Uh, everyone can remember, you know, meeting the men of low moral fibre for the first time and all of that stuff. So, and, and they had quite distinct angles, uh, particularly um, low street uh, with that like very deep perspective, which I remember when I played that originally, you know, I, that was just so exciting to just like be able to walk like so deep into the screen and come out again. So we didn't want to change stuff like that too much, but also places like the interior of the Scum Bar feels quite different. Um, the camera's kind of tilted around further. We didn't want to just rehash McAllen one, right? Just make that game again. Um, we wanted to make a new game, but we, we we felt like Melee was important, right? That was the jumping off place for McAllen 1. And it felt, it felt right that Guybrush goes back to McAllen 1 to start this, start this adventure. But we also wanted to make it different, you know? So there are places that are different that you don't see in McAllen 1 or places that don't exist. I think we had planned to put Meat Hook's museum there. And then we'd, when we were consolidating we decided to move that into um into the forest and, and just sort of minimize the travel got that character with there's a, the curator who's a new guy who's, who's pretty fun what's the story with the wanted poster 
That is the earliest known wanted poster for Captain Kate Capsize. You could tell how notorious she was by the huge number of crimes listed there. Very impressive. I got it from a collector on Fat Island. Those are my own crimes, actually. I was pretty much public enemy number one on Fat Island at the time. I stuck Kate's <laughs> picture on there so she'd get thrown in jail. <laughs> that would never work. Nobody's that clueless in real life. He's thematically good because he sort of represents um, the disturbed fan base. You know, it's just like a super in, like another idea that we had uh, kind of early on that we thought was really funny was that there would be uh, a character who um, was was super into all this pirate stuff and he had all these this memorabilia for Guybrush's previous adventures, but that it, Guybrush himself had just somehow been left on the cutting room floor. He was just out of out of the picture and you just couldn't convince him uh, otherwise. So. He gets everything wrong, right? There's this whole history going on, and Guybrush is very aware of that as he's looking at all these exhibits, and he just has everything completely wrong. And I just, I find that very kind of amusing. Yeah, I, 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 I kind of wonder. It's like sometimes I'll read things people have written, you know, like a history of Monkey Island or whatever, and I'm just reading that, just like slapping my heart and going, what are you thinking? You know, this is not what is really happening. And so in some ways, you know, he was that character. You know, Dave wrote him. Secondo me è una frecciata ai fan esageratamente folli per Monkey Island. Speculano. He needs to be off the rails and totally wrong about everything that happened historically. But very confident. Yes, very, oh, absolutely, yes. Ron had said how he wanted to make sure that we didn't end up with a kind of shoebox feel. Almost like that kind of doll's house feel where you, 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 you walk in a door on one side of the screen and you've just got floor, back wall, ceiling, another door on the other side of the room. You know, basically what you do is like the, pro, the programmer art when you're just like mapping the whole place out. And, and there was a version of every room that was done as programmer art like that. You know, when Dave and I were first redoing it, there, there was a lot of kind of this internal desire to just recreate everything. Well, we have to have meat hooks, we have to have this, we have to have this. And we just cut all that stuff very early on. It's like, well, we don't want to do that. If we're going to bring back a location, it has to be there for a reason. It, it felt that what you want to do okay, with non solo per nostalgia per citazione. almost create Ci one sta. of those, those like 360 images that you, you can take with a camera, you know, and everything is kind of like bent around like a, like a sphere. And you, you kind of want to make the environments feel like they're way bigger than the screen through like distortion. You're, you're just seeing more than you would ever normally see. Because otherwise, just a 169 version of, of a standard room, you know, all you're seeing is, like a, is the back wall. You know, and there's, there's a lot of opportunity to just show more if you're creative with the perspective. Have you seen the pirate leaders around? This is their table. In fact, you'd probably better move. Il tavolo dei leader dei pirati. It's our table, Rummy. We're the pirate leaders. Get lost. Yeah, it's like we wanted to have the pirate leaders, but we didn't want to have the same pirate leaders, right? We wanted pirate leaders that had a new kind of idea about the world, because the world changes, right? The pirate leaders in Monkey Island, you know, they're very very much a part of that on that wonderful pirate mm. culture and they're the good guys and they're helping you out and we wanted to kind of flip that so there are new pirate leaders um and this was just our way of covering like this idea that the industry is changing melee is changing and and Guybrush thinks he's going to do things you know the same way that he always has he's going to go in have a knock back a grog with the pirate leaders and they're going to give him some money he's going to go buy a ship and hire a crew sail off to monkey island and bring back glory for everyone and he gets there pirate leaders are just it's it's new guys and they're young and they're more like real bloodthirsty pirates and they want to sack and pillage and destroy things and they're just not interested in his thing at all they, they won't support him the the old pirate leaders meanwhile are out on the street corner and uh, they're milling around. You meant to mistake them at first for the guys who used to hang out on that street corner. They were also. È vero, ma è capitata la stessa and cosa. And have a conversation with them, sort of about what's happened to them and why are they. And they and they say things about like, oh, once you, once you're painted as old school, that's all anybody sees. And that whole conversation just comes directly out of my experience at Telltale, <laughs> basically, where we went, uh, where we went there. 
and it touches on some some interesting bits of history, like the fact that Guybrush never technically finished his quests in the Secret of Monkey Island. So, technically speaking, he shouldn't be calling himself a pirate. And ah, oh, we're not going to worry about all that. But it's all optional. Like there's 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 no reason to talk to those guys at all. And there was stuff in the code already for if you haven't done it, like in the, in the, in the later chapter, now they're running a fish shop and they, they will talk to you about it in this early scene. Like, oh, we're, we're taking our money and we sold our ship and we're opening a fish shop, it's gonna be great. And so you talk to them again later and there's, there's all this code in there. Like if you haven't spoken to them earlier, then this happens. And if you have, then this other thing happens. So when we were trimming the game and we were looking at it, um, one of the problems we had was that Melee Island is really big. There's a lot of characters on there. And <clears throat> we brought back a lot of, um, a lot of people just for like, let's reintroduce the environment and have some opportunities for nostalgia, but also opportunities to acquaint new people with the, how this whole thing works. Uh, and, it, and it gets pretty long. La and we're del looking for ways to just make that experience shorter so we could get you to like, yeah, just solve the, especially the part that comes before you solve the puzzles to get onto the chuck ship and get out of there. So the first and obvious thing was, oh, those, those guys on the street corner, they're superfluous. They don't have to be there at all. We could just, it's literally one bit in code. We just turn them off so that they're not even on the corner. And you know, this is one of our, one of our regular design talks. And we, we both said, yeah, we could do that. That's a fun conversation. We really hate to cut it. That's, and that was the point at which I said, we should have this, we should have a writer's cut where you can turn it on and off. Uh, if you want to have more, just more lengthy conversations and useless stuff. You just want to kind of see more and you're not worried about how fast am I getting through this game. You have, you have volunteered for the lengthier experience if you, if you turn that on. Guy Brush Threepwood. I would just have the screen up so close. I'd be like zoomed in so far, um, looking at the original pixel art and being like, is that, is that their nose? No, no, that's, that must be their mouth. No, but they haven't got a mouth. But again, it always comes back to the fact that, you know, Wally's distinctive because he's got that mop of red hair and he's got the big monocle. So, you know, if you get those two things right, then ev everyone's going to, you know, come along with you. Something that I really wanted to do with the characters is have them all kind of a little bit angular, um, whether they're like boxy or just they've got sharp angles so that they really feel like characters that I always say that they should look like people that have really been kind of like smashed around the world a bit. You know, they've been they've been on a few oh, too Dios many Dan. boats and they've fallen off too many harbors and they've drunk too much grog and everyone has just become a little bit distorted. Grouping certain characters together, like how does the whole of Le Creux look as a as a team together? It's like Team Le Creux over here and like. Um, all of the people that you'll see on melee over here and you know it's, it's similar to like doing the rooms where you're you're looking for like similarities in color palette but also you want to the, the tricky thing with with characters is particularly in a 2d game like this is making sure that they pop from the backgrounds they're in front of and it's not it's not like a, a you know a tv animation where you're doing each character and each background bespoke for that scene you have no idea that that character is going to walk into that room. Um, so occasionally, you know, something might change in the script or something and you'd suddenly see a character that was never designed to be there. You know, there might suddenly have to be a few uh, tweaks to their design or their colours to, um, to make sure that they, uh, they were still readable. <laughs> Another of the things we were weekend when we were physically together was let's think about some other islands that we can have because we're always trying to kind of build out that world and put new places in it and those are the most fun to explore and he was like i want there to be a cold one this uh, this is a long story so feel free to cut all this out um back in like 2000 um i had thought about doing a new monkey island and Un solo, ragazzi, lascio scorrere lo, lo sento lo stesso a, a really interesting story for that whole thing and my story uh, for that game was the game took place 3,000 years in the future. And it took place on this, you know, snowball earth where everything was frozen and Guybrush had been frozen in ice. And 3,000 years later, um, these pirates had kind of heard the myth of Guybrush 
and their quest was to go find him and thaw him out. Um, and so the whole, a lot of the game just took place sailing in pirate ships through ice and ice cutters and all that stuff. I mean, the, it never went anywhere, but it was, I just found it interesting. You know, the pirates would be in this kind of icy Arctic world. And so when we had to come up with a new island, I'm like, I'm going to build this island. I'm going to build this snow island. And uh, yeah, I like the idea of like, oh, the 19th parallel runs, you know, straight through the Caribbean and anything north of that just instantly becomes like super cold. So I think it was a day or two before I was like, oh, you know what it should be called is Bermuda. <laughs> well, we wanted it to be, you know, a little bit of kind of the Viking Norse stuff, but Yeah, we're also really interested okay, ecco, mi sentivo, eh, mi sono dovuto sincerare you know, solo di una cosa. Questa cosa di Guybrush nel futuro è bellissima. Well, we, I mean, the way we thought of it was, it was sort of like Greenland had been transported into the Caribbean. So we just imagined this kind of smallish island that had been colonized jointly by like Inuit people and Norse people. And they had just sort of come and it read and like that was the society. And in the challenger's chair, all the way from the Southern Caribbean, still in possession of nearly all of his original team, the newcomer, Guybrush Threepwood. If you would each now select your first fish and place it on the plate in front of you. Ooh. Ah. I'm not sure exactly how we started on this idea of the contests that you have to become queen. Like that probably just started with the ridiculous idea that you become ruler of the island. Uh, and then we just sort of went from, from there to, okay, we need some ways to do that. We need some things that these people will care about. Um, and given who they seem like they are, what would those things be? And like, okay, well, you know, you got to be, you know, kind of smart, but you got to be, you know, it's kind of hardy and sturdy and very stoic. And it's just like, here, here are the characteristics that we think these people would have as a, as a culture. And let's put some contests around them and, and, and build silly tests for you to, for you to do, to prove you're one of them. Magic has always been an important facet of the series, going back to that original game. Il and one returning franchise favorite was Karina, proprietor of the House of Mojo shop on Mele Island. Yes. Most often she's referred to as the voodoo lady, Madonna a persona she utilizes to promote the tourist trap store that she operates. But Karina's seemingly true ability to harness magic has helped Guybrush on more than one occasion. Mi ricordo un periodo ho fatto altro che cercare di capire, ma ero bloccato qui in Monkey Island 2. Ho fatto sto cavolo di tragitto con la, con la barca bara uh, non so quante volte cercando di tornare là di oh, avrò lasciato qualcosa li devo capire madonna inauthentic sort of Uh, Louisiana huckster uh, version of voodoo and so we tried to sort of magnify that um, with lots of comments about it you know is this really voodoo well no it isn't but the tourists like it and so that's that's why we do that you know oh it's, I'm sure this is authentic voodoo it says so on the sign you know, that sort of thing but we also um, and we brought in Disney found us a, a, an expert just to consult and we, you know, we brought him in and was like look here's here's what we're doing, here's how we're portraying things, what do you think? And he explained the difference between like, well, there's, you know, there's authentic voodoo like this and there's, and there's um, touristy voodoo like that. And uh, I think as long as you are sticking within these boundaries, it should be okay. And it was, you know, she was also a good foil for the sort of decline of melee as we saw it. You know, it's like the, the new guys are in charge and it's, and they're kind of bleeding the place dry and it's, you know, all the, the familiar things are, are going away. So that's, you know, you, you first meet her and she's having a going out of business sale. Like, oh no, <laughs> what's going on is the, 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 the old ways are, <laughs> are being challenged. There's a new magic in town. Like it's a factor in the story. I think originally it was going to be a little bit bigger of a factor. It's sort of the, you know, the, the new dark magic and the old voodoo magic and sort of those, those being the two opposing forces. They're brewing the potion to go to Monkey Island. So? So I'm going to help them finish it and then we follow them. All I need to do is get them a skull somehow. Make ready to sail. That comes directly out of the fact that Ron had just watched Black Sails, and he insisted that I watch it too. We both liked it a lot, and and there's a heavy element of no, this is how they no, actually do things on these ships. People people got a vote, and there was you know it was, was <laughs> semi democratic, and and uh, uh, the captain could be deposed because you know there's a lot of the crew, and they can depose the captain whenever they want, really. 
That was very interesting because there was so much of the show was about the pirate crew voting and stuff. You know, that the captain wasn't, wasn't an authoritarian leader, but the crew had to vote. And that really intrigued me. And it was all puzzled about, you know, getting their votes. And I just, I thought that was interesting. We needed some, some obstacles for you on the ship. And we decided the biggest one would be that no single member of the crew wants to go to Monkey Island at all. They are all dead set against this idea. And so your primary job is just to convince them all, get them all on your side by doing shipboard politics, which is what we were watching in, in, in Black Sails. As we were, like one of the first things that I did, I think before we even officially signed the contracts and started the project was, a little write-up on what it would be like uh, on that ship, you know, sort of who's there, and uh, and and you know what are the things that they do in their spare time, and, and this sort of business. And you know, a, a lot of that's just not in the game. Però lo devo recuperare. Eh, lo so. Secondo me merita, ragazzi. Non a tutti è piaciuto questo nuovo Monkey Island, ma a me sì. Molto. And for 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 a long time, she was my favorite character. The matter before the crew is the question of whether we should go to Monkey Island. A vote nay. 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 Mm. Aye. The vote to go has to be unanimous. It isn't. Meeting adjourned. But then, you know, you, you start writing and you develop other favorites as you go. It tends to be just sort of whoever you're working on at the, at the moment. You mentioned Flambe. He's, he's pretty fun, you know, the guy who won't, just won't do anything. And, you know, they, they have to keep him around because he's useful for like one or two things. And my ultimate favorite uh, was Putra, the, the, the chef. And I, I think the reason she's my favorite is just that she has the most to say because you, you get on the ship and you're disguised as a zombie and she's the other zombie. And so there's a kind of a, like a natural like, you're, you're like me, and, but, but there's also a, um, an element of how do I pretend to be a zombie and am I going to get into trouble? And so I feel like I had to cover all this in the, in, in the dialogue so there are these like, long chains you can <laughs> go go down where you're getting into conversation with her and she's talking about herself then she's asking you questions as though you're a zombie and you have to come up with answers you're supposed to worry about whether you're getting them right or not uh sometimes i forget i'm a zombie no, i don't every time i try to get a decent cooking job at a restaurant or some swanky manor house they say i'm too green and they play it off like they're talking about experience level but i know what they mean zombies need not apply we don't want him rotting near the food. You must have experiences like that. Ron himself uh, enjoys cooking quite a bit too, which is, you know, one of the other things we got to geek out on when we get together. So, so yeah, I mean, certainly, uh, particularly, you know, you're talking about he's working on this game during COVID lockdown and he's working on, uh, you know, he's doing a lot of cooking at home. So, you know, naturally, uh, the, the 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 pandemia, gonna, see have a little extra flavor. Guybrush isn't anche. really so much about good and evil. He's not out on a crusade to get rid of, you know, sì, the evils in the world. He's, la passione, he just wants to get his giochi, thing. You know, he's, like they say, he's the embodiment of chaotic and neutral. neutral. You know, if sì, you try any of the other ghosts, it's like, hey, it's not really an immediate thing. It's not really an immediate thing. It's not really an immediate thing. Why not be buddies? You know, if I can sneak in there and befriend a... E di solito sono più fighe. Whatever gets the job done. I was going to be a chef and then I turned into a zombie and now there's discrimination against zombies and we can just talk Ragazzi, lascio scorrere, seguo lo stesso, devo occuparmi di una cosa un secondo. Super super fun. Um, so she was my favorite I think to write and and also to talk to. They think all we want to do is eat brains. Which to be honest I do want, but not constantly. That's a terrible stereotype. I really like Putra. The, um, the zombie chef who's sort of almost in danger of eating herself. You know, she's kind of just, full, she's just got meat like hanging off her. To be honest, the, the character description was such a joy. There's, I've got like 20 other versions of Putra that I would have been just as happy if she'd turned up in the game. Gullet is another favorite. You know, he's your uh, overbearing boss who gets thrown off the ship and uh, pretty early on, then you can kind of go down and make fun of him. Um, it's just kind of sometimes fun to write the really mean guys and make them as mean as possible. And like when he's, there's a scene where he's describing uh, what your life is going to be like down in the hold. I had a ball right in that. Uh, what if I need to, um, you know, use the portal? Don't get anything on the ledge outside, though. I hate an unsightly ledge. So if you think about it, we're trying to make a game that's sort of similar in scope to The Secret of Monkey Island. The Secret of Monkey Island has part on Melee Island and 
part on Monkey Island and some parts on ships, and you go back to Melee Island very briefly. Uh, Return to Monkey Island has a part on Melee Island and some parts on ships and a part on Monkey Island, and we were going to put four other islands in here in the middle. It's like, oh, we, or, uh, we're actually planning a game that is twice the size of the original one, and that is probably a mistake. And we, <laughs> it just sort of, as we were building the thing and realizing just exactly how much work it was going to be, that's when we started to trim the fat, as they say, cut, cut some things out. And uh, Cog Island. We had designed out some puzzles, and it, it was sort of a, um, an homage to the fact that we both like missed. And so these were sort of a little bit more mechanical puzzles with machinery and stuff. And uh, the idea was the mother of the locksmith had been the designer of this island and had built all these things there. And this was just sort of part of your, um, your chapter four questing was you had to go there and, and get one of the keys. So yeah, there was lots of sort of, you know, pulling levers and shooting things out of cannons. It was all, you know, appropriately themed to the, uh, to the time period, um, but definitely felt a little more mist-like than, than the rest of it. And, and so when the time came and we were like, oh, we, we need to make some serious cuts here, Cog Island is the thing that um, sort of tonally fits the least well with the rest of the game and it lifts out pretty easily. So despite the fact that we like it, I think that's what has to go. There was previously another island called Meyer Island, which was basically a trash dump. And he did some puzzles in there, and I think we took our favorite bits of that and moved them onto Terror Island and threw the rest of it away. We did a little earlier consolidation going on there. It was, I guess it was just basically um, came out of the idea of wanting to do a place with that tone where you would walk around and it would just feel really scary everywhere you went. Uh, and a lot of that just has to do with how the art is drawn. Also the, the principal feature of that island is the Cave of Screams, which is of course behind the Maze of Twisty Passages, which of course comes directly from Adventure in the Colossal Caves. Uh, Ron and I had both played that when we were much younger. The game has several mazes in it and neither of us likes mazes at all. Um, but we keep putting them in our games because people do seem to like them and then we, we always have some sort of clever way to, to get around them. And then um, sticking Herman at the bottom just made perfect sense because you know he's always stranded somewhere so if somebody's going to be down at the bottom of this cave it's definitely going to be him. Herman Toothrot? I think so. It's been a while. We, we took it as um, an opportunity to uh, sort of expand on this idea of Guybrush's obsession with finding the secret, uh, causing harm to other people. You'll see it's happening throughout the game, and this is one of the instances as he gets down there, he finds Herman, and then uh, he manages to get out of the cave himself, but can't take Herman with him, and you can't really get back in there anymore because your, your lamp is broken then, and you can't, you just can't go get him, and, and you just sort of forget about it, which is a little bit of a strange thing to do. Well, that wasn't so hard. What happened to Mr. Toothrot? When? Did you get him out of the cave? How'd you do it? That's not part of this story. Oh, okay. Yeah, I mean, the Gumbrish does, but it's not malicious, right? I mean, Gumbrish is not a malicious person. His, his wake of destruction is because of his innocence. That is very interesting, you know, as a designer and a writer, because you can have somebody that leaves chaos in their wake but because it's not malicious, right? You don't have to deal with him suddenly becoming the villain of the story. Nice to see you again too, Wally, whatever your last name is. I spent years in therapy getting over being burned, blinded, blown up, abandoned, and marooned because of you. <laughs> yeah, good times, huh? So it just comes from almost overexcitement. He's so excited about this and i think about just a lot of that with my dog. E my eccomi dog ragazzi, perdonatemi so dell'assenza, ho voluto fare una cosa. And just constantly uh. running around and doing stuff and creating chaos in, in, in her wake. Yeah, the, Tanto, I, stavo I sentendo, the mi sono messo le cuffie uh, wireless. The fanaticism of Guybrush with this is, it, it comes in on, on several levels. Um, it's Quella cosa degli ingranaggi era veramente figa. How adventure game characters behave in general. But it's also a little bit about the nostalgia that the fan community has built up and the fervor which, with which people have been approaching Ron over the years about the secret and wanting to know what it was. Um, just the importance of it had become so huge that we wanted to, we just wanted to show something. Ho notato uh, molte, molte persone anche deluse da questo, where, però, um, a proposito di nostalgia. Like a cutscene or something like that, 
In realtà invece è perfettamente in linea, secondo me. And, and so we did that for that scene with the chopping down the tree. And I was, I was, I was the one who got to describe that one and, and basically shepherd it through the process. And at every step of the way, my comment was always like, that's awesome, more, make it more horrible. And, you know, th th they were all a little, a little like, really, you know, do you want more? And, and uh, uh, Cody Hahn, I think, did all of the little weeping animals. And he was like, Just people started to get really into it until there was, you know, finally it was like, yeah, it just goes on and on and there's terror and horror and fire and just, and I was like, yes, perfect. That's exactly like, that's the vibe that we need from this scene to, to make it. <laughs> Another resource has given its all in support of my personal goals. It's what nature is for. I must have startled them while I was whittling. Some animals are quite skittish. Part of how I see adventure games and what's fun about them To begin with, is this idea da quanto mi sono divertito con questo tipo di ironia si trova raramente nei giochi questo tipo di ironia nello specifico ultimamente e quindi that a lot with this game uh, was a real treat and then bringing it all back there's a scene with the lanes towards the end of the game where you're walking through the woods and she's just like by the way you know, I've been hearing some things about what's been going on Uh, and let's talk about them and sort of, it's just sort of a callback to like, in case you hadn't noticed, here are all the terrible things you have done <laughs> during the case, through the course of this game. She's a grounding <laughs> influence. Yeah, I've always thought about her all the way back to the original mechanics is that she's the smartest person in the room, right? She kind of understands everything that's going on. Um, Guybrush is, is a little kid like, you know, and so she's kind of always having to kind of rein him in a little bit. He can just spin off into these weird, you know, ideas and angles and, and schemes and plans, but she never does, right? She kind of knows this is the right thing to be doing. We should be doing this particular thing. So she's always been in, in all of the stories. And I think she occupies that role in this story as well. Elaine was quite hard um, because initially the design that we'd gone for was a little more a little more rugged almost. Um, <laughs> you know similarly to what I was saying about the other characters that you know she she looked like she'd been around the world a few times and bashed around a bit and um, and it wasn't until quite last minute that um, she kind of got softened a little how we wanted the relationship between Guybrush and Elaine to feel these were things that we had to kind of find in the dark Uh, as we were making the game, because our initial stab at them was like, no, it's, that's too mean. Neither Elaine nor Guybrush comes off well uh, this way, and we kind of don't want that, and the, you know, the, the, our playtesters don't like it. You always amaze me. I had no idea you knew ship repair. I don't know any more than you do, but I brought a manual. Why don't we fix it together? Like any good pirate story, Return to Monkey Island was made entirely in secret, with members of the development team unable to tell their friends or family. Ron didn't want fan expectation influencing either him or the new team. In a way, the pandemic made some of the logistics around this a wee bit easier. When the game was finally announced, Ron decided to do so on April Fools. Not just because of his long-running hatred of the day, something he's blogged about on his Grumpy Gamer blog a decade earlier, but because he had previously said he would never work on a game with an intellectual property he didn't own. The idea of Ron working on a new Monkey Island game seemed like a fantasy, perhaps even a great April Fool's joke. But as April 1st landed on a Friday and the tease went live, the reveal trailer the team had been working on was going to have to wait an entire weekend before it launched, and the truth was revealed. So there was this weird che, in between zone. Che there. cosa è stato il primo trailer, non ci potevo credere. Tell anyone it had been announced. And pretty much the whole art team had come to London to visit um, and we all met up for the first time ever um, that weekend. But none of us could talk about the game because we didn't want anyone to overhear us talking about the game that had been announced but hadn't officially been announced. So we were all, you know, out drinking grog and having a great time, but all being very careful not to, um, to let on why we were meeting. When we first announced the game in April and we showed some of the art, like there was a, a hue and cry from a very small portion of the uh, fan base who said, oh, we don't like that. 
We're never getting really used to that. Uh, quella Once cosa. Past, the, the the la par- eh, la, fact, il lato artistico ad alcuni non è piaciuto. Start poking into the details a bit more and you know there was some backlash. Um, I got quite a few emails that weren't very nice, but you know. <laughs> I, uh, but I think, you know, I, I kind of get it because You know, I did that original picture of Guybrush because I wasn't, you know, entirely... I was responding to some other art that had been um, done of Guybrush and I wanted to do my take. Um, but, you know, I, I prefer to do it a bit more um, constructively of um, <laughs> paint, painting my version of some art rather than sending death threats, but anyway... <laughs> Nacci di morte, Digos. And then the game comes out and they're like, oh, this is really good. And when's the next one? Um, so so I, I had to take it all with a grain of salt. Like, this is, this is probably just going to blow over. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's never a right answer. You know, that's, you just have to have confidence in what you're doing and, and, and go for it. And, you know, I think if we hadn't had, if we'd been a totally new team, if it had been me and the, the artists and we're, some, some people weren't even born when um, Monkey Island came out, But if it was just us making the game, it would have been like terrifying because it's like, oh no, we've we've taken on this 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 franchise and you know we've we've kind of screwed it up. The fact that we're there with the series creators of the game, like really gave us the confidence that like it's like, well, if this is what you know that they're looking for and they're super happy with it and we're super happy with it, then we can't have <laughs> made something too bad. No, infatti, però effettivamente ad alcune pie- persone non è piaciuto il nuovo stile artistico. Posso capirlo, ok? Neanche io sono stato mostruosamente contento, ma alla fine mi ci sono un po' abituato. Oh, vero. E infatti è quello il problema. Prima di Let's first talk about an answer 30 years in the making. What exactly was the secret? <laughs> well, I knew what the ending was going to be initially, although not exactly, right? And a lot of times you have an ending and I wanted to go in this direction for a story, um, but you don't have all the peculiars, right? So I, I didn't have all the details about how it was going to end, but I knew I knew how it was going to end. And a lot of that is because, you know, people ask me constantly, you know, over the last 30 years, what is the secret of Monkey Island, right? It's, it's right there in the title, the secret of Monkey Island. And so people want to know what is the secret of Monkey Island. And I've never told anybody, you know, I've just always kept that to myself and you know, made funny jokes about it. And, but I felt with this game, I, I need to tell people what the secret is. Like the secret of Monkey Island is, um, it, it's sort of a silly idea. And it's, it felt like getting a tattoo in your 20s and thinking it's cool and fun at that time. And then 30 years later, you have to explain it to people over the dinner table. And you know maybe it feels a little ridiculous and embarrassing by that point. And so we went back and forth. Che bel paragone! Quanto è giusto sto paragone? Reveal it originally we weren't. And, and there were the Bronx, thoughts grazie about mille well, sub. things change. Grazie, grazie, grazie. About how things change, possibly with secret changes too. Possibly it is not immutable. And again, there was not really any version of that that felt good. Um, what we were after early on was wrapping the ending around the conflict between Guybrush's interest in the secret and his relationship with Elaine. And, and so there were drafts of what we wanted to do with the ending that were all about that. And we actually got pretty far. We produced some material for some of them and you know, sort of tested them out on everybody. And universally people were like, yeah. You know, and even Ron and I were like, yeah, it's not working. That's, you know, it's not good. And, and so there was a point at which um, Ron basically said, let's just, let's just rip the Band-Aid off and, and get weird with this. And 
reveal the real secret and do it in this way. And he said, you know, we'll, we'll go through the thing and then we'll come out and uh, you'll, you'll be uh, basically in a version of the Uh, spoilers. Um, <ride> Quella porta. Quante cose c'è? È un continuo di citazioni e rimandi e ricollegamenti e piccole cose e ironie che ti ricordano un'altra situazione. And you know, Guybrush being in an amusement park, that is the secret. That's what it was. You know, back in 1989 when I was putting all this together, it was, he was in an amusement park. And that's why it has that title. Just because the secret was he was in an amusement park. And this was, you know, very early on. So um, LeChuck wasn't a character yet. You know, the protagonist in the early stories was the, the owner of the amusement park. You know, nobody knew they were in amusement parks. So all the other pirates in the world, they were all trapped, you know, in this kind of Westworld, you know, style amusement park. So, I mean, it did, it did change a lot, but that is the secret of McGowan. And so I knew that I wanted to, to reveal that in this game. So I kind of knew how the game was going to end. Yeah, was he knowingly in this amusement park? No, no, he didn't know he was. It was, it was something that he discovered was that he was basically trapped along with everyone else in this amusement park. I think what happened was, was as the game kind of developed even more, I just kind of drifted away from that. Um, especially when you know, I read On Stranger Tides, which was an incredibly influential book. Um, that just solidified a whole lot of the story to me, um, especially with LeChuck and the protagonist and how that all worked. And, and so the original stuff, I think, just slowly slid, although you can still see it. Or you can still see it in, in those first two games, little anachronistic things. I mean, even the grog machine that sits in, in stands, I mean, that is a holdover from that original um, Vero. idea. And that, it took me a while to get on board with that, actually. Because I was like, wow, that is going to be really shocking and weird for the audience. But I sort of felt like, oh, this feels like Monkey 2 all over again. You know, we're, we're doing something really bizarre with the ending, and it'll be controversial. We ended with an ending of a similar nature to, like, the ending of Monkey Island 2. You know, not just the ending where it's like, you know, the sort of ending that you would get at the end of an Indiana Jones movie. I think it would have been a disservice to the to the game if it hadn't done something dramatic and uh, surprising like that with the end. Glad you finally made it, kid. What, Stan? It's closing time and everyone wants to go home. Last chance to hand over the key, locksmith. What do you mean it's closing time? I just got here. No, oh, I don't have time for this. I'm late for an important meeting. Take my keys and shut off all the lights before you leave. I'm not liable for anything that happens after closing time. There were versions of it where Stan was sort of a little more in your face in directing, and then there was a cool version where um, Stan was turning the lights off, and you were had to turn them back on again uh, in order to, to get over to where the secret was. You basically had to um, win this uh, light flipping battle with him. It's, it's true, right? It's the truth. That was the secret we had in mind 30 years ago. And so that's where we're going with it. And we were able to um, take that and really say some things about storytelling and the gaming experience and the experience of sort of playing uh, these particular games over the years and what they sort of meant to people. We spent a lot of time on that ending. You know, there's a lot of kind of iterations of trying to figure out how we really wanted to... Beh, questo to finale è stata una delusione per un po' di persone. Idea, just had a lot of, <laughs> Ma in realtà l'ho sempre you know, ritenuto in linea con l'ironia del, del titolo. Just like hashing this whole thing out. We knew we wanted to do it. You know, to me, the multiple endings aren't so much about having multiple endings, but it's, it's really about how how players can think about things tell me what mulholland drive means you can't right and Antonio, but everybody so has so so bene questa sera and so un po provato però so abbastanza bene like, i was really playing into that whole thing about how everybody can derive their own meaning for something right i mean readers and players and viewers they they make their own 
meaning a lot of times to endings of stuff. So it was really about emphasizing that. One of the things that was concerning for us the entire time was this idea of canon. And what's canon and what's not canon. And ah, we giusto, were vero, with tutte quelle che che that already was somewhat paradoxical in terms of how the different uh, incarnations of it had, had, had dealt with each other. And so when we announced the game, uh, I was saying from day one, like, canon is something that we are going to pay attention to as much as makes sense for this story that we're trying to tell. But if, we, if it gets into a conflict between our story and the canon, we're going to go with our story because we're trying to make a, something that feels good on its own. Uh, and, and I was aware that there are people who are canon wonks who want everything to sort of fit neatly. You know, I, I used to be heavily into comic books yeah. too, so I, I get how this works. And it's fun to sort of try and put all the pieces together. But at some point, we had to just take a stand and say, yeah, some things are not going to match up. And I feel like this, uh, the ending, um, where you get to kind of put your own stamp on it, uh, feels like the, the perfect expression of that. Like, there is, there is no canon um, here. It belongs to you. Um, how do you like that? I think some people, you know, sort of don't, they just want to be told what's going on. They, they, they're uncomfortable with that responsibility. But that's our story, and that's the end of it is, is, is open-ended by, by design. Dad, that was a silly ending, and it didn't even make any sense. You're terrible <laughs> at a, endings. I thought you liked silly endings. You and Chucky play the ending of Monkey Island 2 really silly. That's different. We're kids, and we're just goofing around. You're the one who said you can't just change things. You said that's not how storytelling works. I did? I want to know the secret. You have to tell me what it was. Everything leading up to that... Um, the discussion with Boybrush uh, about the story and the ending of the story and is a chance for the, the player to express for themselves what this means to them. You know, we don't, we don't nail it down. We provide options. And we do that for specific reasons. That, that it's going to mean a lot of things to a lot of people, and that's part of what makes the story good. There isn't any one answer to what the secret is. It's not like a rock or a banana. It's like a story. It changes with time and the person telling it. Everyone you ask will have a different idea. Mom, Dad won't tell me what e the secret is. E questo è il messaggio alla community. Your outlandish stories again. I was telling him the one about how we found the secret of Monkey Island. <laughs> oh, that one. <laughs> Every time you tell that story, the ending gets stranger and stranger. I mean, I think Dave may have a different opinion, which I think <laughs> is great. Bad. You know, no, no, I love, kind of love this cosa. and you know, morph it into kind of whenever we want. But for me, it was just about how how stories, you know, can change. It's like you're telling something, and you can change the story as you're going on. I mean, very rarely are stories a a completely historical account of what happened, right? And and some of that just becomes from you know players their their ideas of the original you know two monkey island games there's a lot of you know rose tinted glasses that come with that that they may remember stuff that isn't actually true or they've completely made up stuff they've taken one little thread of an idea that we never kind of decided to to make into something real and they've made it into something real and in their minds it's canon Right, because they've kind of forgotten that they, they just made this up with a couple of their friends one night. So of course it's canon. This is true, and that's always interesting to me. And that's a little so bit about what happened. Guybrush telling the story to his son. Is, you know, he has an impression on my son. Grazie. 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 The old Monkey Island player who's just kind of taking things off in a weird direction. You know, he and Chucky have you know played the ending of, of Monkey Island 2 really weird, which Garbus acknowledges, and so it's just it's just fun to play with that a little bit. Hmm. 
The ending of Return to Monkey Island may not have worked for me if it was my first game in the series, if I played it in my 20s, or if the original game hadn't been literally the first game I ever completed. But sitting in my new home on the other side of the world from where I grew up, a 36 year old with a wife, a child and a heart bursting with nostalgia for these old adventures, it reached in and squeezed on my heart. Serio, anche per me è stata così. We always do, be them games we enjoy or hate. Nostalgia has as much to do with the time and place in which we played those games as it does with the games themselves. It's about us, who we were then and who we are now. Epilogo, il capitolo finale. Ma dovrebbe essere... Ritorno a mancare dovrebbe essere finale, no? Map to the treasure of Maya Island. It's going to be a fun adventure. I'll meet you down there. You know what exactly Guybrush is thinking as he stares off into space is really dependent on what the player is bringing to the game as they play it. They're, they've had an experience that we control part of it, but they control the rest of it. There's a co-authorship going on there. I think that Guybrush staring into the camera like that was me. That was me staring into the camera and thinking about, well, what does all this mean? It's, it's complicated and, you know, I don't have control of it anymore, you know, both, both creatively and you know, legally. Um, so well, what does all this mean to me? And so having him stare into the camera was, was, was me just kind of staring into the thing on what, what does kind of all this mean? You, Dave and I were working on the ending and some things just weren't gelling right, right? We didn't feel like it was really kind of getting that right emotional message that we wanted to do. And we were just chatting, you know, on Zoom one day and, you know, Dave said, oh, well, you know, when we started this project, I just kind of wrote this little, you know, note to myself. We should, we should read that and just see if it sparks anything. I, I wrote the letter in July of 2020. Just like when I heard that the contracts had been signed, we were going to start the project the next week. I was like, I, I just need to get some thoughts down on paper about what we're about to try to do and how I expect it to go. So I wrote this letter basically to Ron and myself, and I stuck it in a file and I put it in a folder and I didn't look at it for a long time. And then at first we actually put the letter literally in the chest where the secret goes. And then we put it on a wall and both of those felt like, no, that's it's, it's too many levels of um, disruption of the fantasy within the fantasy. So we decided to put it where it is, which is sort of stashed at the scrapbook for you to find accidentally afterwards. Uh, and I just feel like that's, it was a good, you know, accidental um, period to put on the sentence. Non mi ricordo di averla trovata in game place, questa. As Ron and Dave now, or if the, the fact that they did it the way they did it has made it easier for me. Um, but this has been the most comfortable of endings <laughs> for me, you know, and like I say, every time you, you, I, you know, I get the phone call or I get the email and there's that crazy elation because it's like, ah, oh, we get to do it again, you know? And then we go in and it's just nuts and there's all, and you do the work, which is so much fun. And then there's all that quiet anticipation when you got to keep it quiet. And then there's the announcement and I, you know, and seeing all the reactions and then it eventually kind of fades away. I, I've always had difficulty dealing with the hope that it's going to come back. And to be clear, I still do. I mean, that's never going away. I will, I will, I will, I will do Guybrush as long as they'll let me and as long as I still have the voice for it. But I kind of feel like this is the first time where it's like, okay, if this is it for the first time, I'm okay with it. I'm okay with it. It would not be my choice, but I'm okay with it. Yeah, I'm, I'm very happy with the reception it got. You know, the, there were, things that you know I or Dave and I were trying to kind of do with the story that did really resonate, right? They landed exactly, you know, how we want them to land. I mean some people hated it, as as always. Um, but a lot of people liked it, you know, and and for me watching um, you know, YouTube videos of people who were literally in tears. They were crying, you know, as 
not that I enjoy making people cry, but but it, it it really said, okay, well, I think we we did succeed in that. We did we touched that thing that we wanted to touch with with the game. Working on it and and, and writing it, I, th I think we felt like there were some things that we needed to wrap up. But as, as is typical for us, you know, we didn't wrap things up with quite with a neat little bow on it. I, you know, I wouldn't I wouldn't say distinctly distinctly that. Would, would definitely be my last one. I, I, I certainly had to approach it as though it were, because the, the, the circumstances that had to kind of line up for this project to happen were pretty, you know, it's like waiting for the celestial spheres all to align. Yeah, I don't Infatti think it was a, a prima. way to say goodbye. Right? I was not doing this as, as this is my last game, you know, Monkey Island game ever. I mean, it, it may be, but that was not a goal. You know, it's a world that I love. You know, I, I like the Mechanic world. I like, you know, the characters in that world. And it was fun to kind of revisit them. But, you know, as I said earlier, it's like I want to revisit them um, kind of in a fresh way. It's like I don't. Like, I will not be the person that is turning out Monkey Island 17, you know, at some point. Um, it's just, it's not interesting to me. It's like if I'm going to do a sequel for a game, I want to make sure that I have something new and interesting to say in it. I think with this, with with this Monkey Island, with Return of Monkey Island, it kind of was about that. And it's like, okay, well, we have something new and interesting to say, and so it made it worth doing. Dai, che figo! Eh ragazzi, ovviamente allora, già il, gio il gioco è stato così per me. Sentite la musica. Questa è, questo mi sembra di averlo direttamente dall'amiga, santi Dio. Pure un po' troppo forte. Ok. Ma com come da... Come da copione, quando faccio le reaction, li, prendo sempre integrali il, i video, compresi i credits, perché penso che sia assolutamente giusto. Abbiamo visto qualcuno fatto da qualcu da qualcosa fatto da qualcun altro, quindi pieno credito. E ovviamente andatevi a iscrivere al canale di eh, No Clip, okay? lo trovate su YouTube. Ci sono un sacco di cose belle, molte le abbiamo viste insieme e vi invito a supportarli come meglio potete con un'iscrizione, un like, mi raccomando e se volete c'è il Patreon, ci sono tanti altri modi per supportarli fanno un lavoro eccezionale riguardo a questo documentario devo dirvi che è stato molto più eh, emotivo e molto più personale di tanti altri e questa cosa da molti punti di vista eh, mi piace capisco che sia un po' più eh, diciamo da, da un tono decisamente diverso rispetto ad altri eh, però eh, immagino che eh, insomma sia, sia nella natura delle cose ok non è stato uno di quei documentari incredibilmente eccitanti o che ti fanno rimanere un po' sulle spine eh, per quello che succede con minimo colpo di scena tipo che so il documentario su Final Fantasy XIV è stato è stato è, perché lo sviluppo di Final Fantasy XIV è stata una specie di telenovela a sé stante e veramente una cosa incredibile e eh, questo no questo no è stato un gruppo di persone che si ritrovano a fare un gioco dopo veramente tanti anni una cosa che non credevano possibile oppure sembrava una cosa così lontana eh, con tanti astri che si allineano eccetera per me ovviamente cioè parlare di monkey island vedere un documentario su monkey island è per me completamente impossibile staccare questa cosa dal, dal sentimento di nostalgia eccetera perché sono stati alcuni dei giochi originali che mi hanno fatto amare questo medium quindi no, ma per me hanno sicuramente un, un, un forte significato nel mentre effettivamente riattacchiamo la musica perché è meglio e hanno avuto sicuramente un forte significato ed è ed è una cosa che è stata per me eh, importante e spero tanto che io, sapete che c'è è una di quelle occasioni in cui francamente non so se eh, augurarmi di averne un altro nel senso io amo Monkey Island ne vorrei un altro però eh, ovviamente ne voglio un altro con questa qualità con questa ispirazione eccetera e non so se ricapiterà l'ispirazione 
il desiderio di raccontare un'altra storia dentro Monkey Island e gli astri che si allineano perché l'IP non è più di proprietà di Ron Gilbert o di qualcuno vicinissimo a lui eccetera quindi francamente io sto trattando Return to Monkey Island come l'ultimo gioco di Monkey Island un gioco che effettivamente non pensavo neanche ci sarebbe mai stato e però chi lo sa chi lo sa magari nel futuro verremo sorpresi di nuovo un po' ne dubito francamente anzi ne dubito moltissimo però anche se così dovesse essere sono molto felice di aver avuto l'occasione di giocare a questo Monkey Island già l'ultimo che è stata una cosa completamente inaspettata devo dire e già questo è stato un grande regalo e se così dovesse essere mi va bene anche così